Yeah, six kids at the house last night. And a dog and a cat. And a dog and two cats. <laughs> All right, if you want to get ahead, turn over to First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse sixteen. I know I said it for your guys' benefit, but I'll say it to the online audience as well. We're very glad that uh, you got to meet the author of the Green Book finally online last week. And to see a lesson from Mike, we're very happy about that. Yes. Oh, speaking of the books, we are still giving them away. I almost forgot to plug them myself. Uh, we're giving away uh, the yellow book, Jesus Wasn't Talking to You, and the green book, Things I've Been Taught from the Bible That Are Not True. We can mail physical copies anywhere in the world. So just email me at info at ohiogracebible.com with your snail mail address. So this week is going to be, I know we're having food here. I've got not a full sermon, but I'm not a sermonette either. It's a little bit longer. We'll call it a diet sermon. Uh, so hopefully about 30 minutes or so. But let's read this verse together. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's not very hard English to understand, is it? We don't need interpretation, we just need to read it, right? It's pretty straightforward. Rejoice evermore. That's pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? Amen. Give thanks in everything. What's your exegesis on that verse? Well, I think it pretty much means what it says, right? Not hard to understand. Turn over, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. squared. He's going down a list here of instructions and he's telling the Romans, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. So you see prayer again there. But looking at patient in tribulation, what's right next to it? I mean, we know what tribulation is. You're having a terrible day. You should be rejoicing in hope while you're going through tribulation and being patient. And what really strikes me about these verses is, you know, obviously God the Holy Spirit wrote them, but the man he chose to write them, to pen them for us, he didn't exactly have a happy, easy American life. I mean, we don't, we don't have to go through 2 Corinthians 11 to see all the misery and suffering and pain that Paul went through, but you could have that for your homework. Go read the last half of 2 Corinthians 11. But Paul met Christ on his way to oppose what God was doing, and after Christ saved him and gave him his marching orders, the rest of Paul's life, if we're judging it by happy, healthy, comfortable American standards, the rest of Paul's life was miserable. I mean, he got an F minus on Joel Osteen's best life now. 
<laughs> failed completely. But I mean, that's what Paul did. He went from, okay, here's some trouble. Wow, that was terrible. Let's go on to the next town. Oh, here's misery. Oh, that was terrible. Let's go on to the next town. Here's more trouble. Oh, they beat me again. Oh, they stoned me. Oh. But this guy that's going through all these horrible circumstances is the guy telling you all the time, rejoice. Be thankful. Rejoice. Hope. How? Despairing for life and limb, persecuted, chased, lied about, beaten, shipwrecked, constantly preaching, hope, thanks, rejoice, patience. Now, we all know that is our doctrine. We know that's our marching orders. We know that's our instructions. How do we get there? I'm not there. I don't think many of us are there. But let me, let me lay it on a little bit thicker here. I'm going to interject a real world story that happened this week in my family. So I have a cousin. He's not a close cousin. He's, he's the kind of cousin you see at family reunions once a year. You have a nice conversation and then you don't see him until the next year when you have another co nice conversation. Uh, but he's in his 30s and married. He's got two, two little girls. And he's a real doting father. You know, you watch him with his little girls, and you can just tell that, like, being a dad to those little girls is, is just his most favorite thing to do. So he wakes up this week with a bad headache. And then he starts hallucinating. So they're like, okay, well, we got to get you the urgent care now. Not long after that, he gets to take a helicopter ride. And it's not the fun ride. It's the, the ride that you take when you're about to die. So he's now in his 30s, loving father, doting, fighting for his life. His brain's bleeding. Let's put that on the board. Wait a minute. So while they're trying to figure out his brain bleed, he figures that they figure out he's got a rare advanced leukemia. So he's in critical condition. So the brain's bleeding, and the doctors come in and say, well, if we don't start chemotherapy now, he's going to be dead in 48 hours. You wake up in the morning, and, or you go to bed the night before, and you feel relatively OK. By the middle of the next day, you're fighting for your life. And you don't know if you're going to make it the next day or two. So he's still in critical condition. His life's hanging in the balance. He's at the Cleveland Clinic. So best case scenario for him, I survive the next few days, and then I get to go on to a battle with leukemia. Trying to stay alive there. You know, an advanced, rare leukemia. Worst case scenario, you die. So his wife is looking down the barrel of being a widowed young mother with two little girls with no daddy. My cousin's looking down the barrel of, you know, he's missing out on raising his daughters and all the firsts in their life that he'll never see. And you think about the poor little girls, they're no doubt sitting around scared, wondering, is daddy going to die? Am I going to have a daddy tomorrow? Is daddy ever going to come home? So if we're looking at circumstances, it's all around horrible. There's no way to describe it other than horrible, horrible, horrible. There's nothing good about it. You just looking at the situation, there's, there's nothing good. There's nothing good. Front ways, back ways, upside down, sideways. 
So we look at all of this. And can we remember what Paul said now? Rejoice evermore. Rejoice in hope. Give thanks in everything. While your family may be facing a horrible tragedy. While you may be facing a horrible tragedy. This is where you say, yeah, right. That kind of talk works in church. That's fine for Sunday morning, but we're in the real world here. I don't want to hear any of that. This is where we need to ask ourselves, what will we say if you found yourself in the waiting room with this man's wife? Rejoice evermore! How would that work out? What do you say if you find yourself maybe in the hospital bed next to him? He can't talk right now because of the brain bleed, but he could listen. What do you say in this situation to him if you're in the hospital bed? Rejoice in hope. Everybody's praying for you, but you keep getting worse. And yes, yeah, suffering and agony when he's conscious. Maybe you turn on the old TV and turn it to the religious channel. And there's that big fake million dollar smile on the face of Joel Osteen saying, God's got a wonderful plan to prosper you. You're going to be doing great. Really? My best case scenario is I get to survive to be miserable and fight leukemia and try to live through that too. This is real life here. How in the world can this verse apply in this situation? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Not here, Lord. Not here in this hospital room. Not here with my wife crying wondering what's going to happen, how did my world fall apart in a day? That verse doesn't count here. Or does it? I mean, it says people buy, spend millions of dollars trying to buy books to figure out what the will of God is. And this verse says right here, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And it's very clear, it doesn't say for everything, does it? Lord, I'm thankful for the brain bleed, the fact that I'm dying, and for this rare advanced leukemia that went undiscovered until today. That's not your prayer. But we, as believers in Christ, should be able to have a day like this. And if we're strong in the faith and strong in doctrine, we should be amidst the pain, amidst the suffering, amidst the uncertainty, amidst the agony, amidst the worry, we should be able to find ways to do this. I'm not there yet. I'm trying to be. I suspect that not very many of you are there yet. Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope of what? Either way, in that situation, your life's wrecked. Can we start with the medical bills? If he lives. You know, he's had these brain bleeds. They don't know how much brain damage he's going to have. And if he does have brain damage, well, what about am I going to survive the fight with the leukemia? Where's my hope? 
any which way you look at it, I'm not going to be the dad that I wanted to be to my little girls. Even if I make it, how can I rejoice and hope in that? I hope I've done a decent enough job explaining the situation. It's pretty hopeless. But those verses are still there, saying what they say. It's our apostle talking to us. This is a guy who has experience dealing with pain and dealing with tragedy. That's the guy preaching at us, rejoice in hope. You'll see it if you look for it when you read through his letters to the churches. And he'll talk about, I know you're suffering. I know you're going through this horrible persecution. I know all these bad things are happening. Rejoice! Be patient. So, how? I'm a practical guy. You know, you can talk all these nice things. How do you get there? What if the worst thing happens and mommy sits down with the little girls and has to tell them daddy's died? How do you, as a person, Tell your little girls, look, daddy's gone. We're going to sit down and we're going to cry till all our tears are done. And all our tears are going to come out. And after that, we're going to rejoice in hope. How do you get there? Look over, please, at 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. No, okay. The first four verses of the chapter, we see the gospel. How can I be saved? How can I have my sins forgiven? And the answer is, you can't do anything. Amen. When Paul declares his gospel, it's things I can't do and you can't do. It's Christ's death, Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection. You trust that. You put your faith in that. He will save you. But there's more than the first four verses in the chapter. If you look down into the 50s, In verse 53, one way that I'm sure all of you may have thought of by now that you can rejoice in hope is, is this a saved person? And by all accounts, the answer is yes. My cousin has trusted Christ's payment for his sins. So even though he started off on Monday, plans for the week, plans for the weekend, plans for life, plans for his little girls. By the middle of the week, I don't know if I'm going to live to tomorrow. One way that we can rejoice in hope, <coughs> that mommy, as she's talking with her little girls, can rejoice in hope, is daddy's not gone. He's just gone from here. He's still alive. He's just not alive here. In 1 Corinthians 15:53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So how can I rejoice evermore, rejoice in hope, and give thanks in everything? Daddy won. Daddy came to meet death, and because Daddy was in Christ when he met death, Daddy won. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So you can say to these little girls, if he dies, his life is not over. His real life actually just started. Daddy got to have the first day of his real life, the best day of his life so far. 
the only thing that changed for him is for the first time ever, he's feeling and existing without pain and sorrow and the weight of sin and flesh for the first time ever. Can you ever think about that, what that's going to feel like? The first instant where you don't have the weight of sin and death on you anymore? I mean, I, I, I was, things I think about, I was at the doctor's office and getting an adjustment. And when the doctor was done and I was, wow, I didn't realize how much pain I was in and how restricted I was until it went away. How much more when I drop 180 pounds of sinful flesh forever? No longer, just not even physical pain, but emotional, mental turmoil that we all deal with for all that to just whew, gone forever. It's going to be amazing. And that's, we're told by our apostle in death, that's how we take comfort. We're told comfort one another with these words. I don't know where it's at. You left it here. <laughs> you can always just drop a match in. The, the lighter on the grill is not working anymore. But, you know, this fact about death for a believer that's true, and even a person who's not, you know, versed on the doctrine can come over time to, to understand it and have comfort and peace, but I want to know how in the moment I can be the center of the storm. I can be the, the stability, the eye of the hurricane. How can I, when this happens to me and it's me on the table or my spouse on the table, how can I have the strength and doctrine to where I'm able to do this in the moment? People like to say, you know, you get strength you didn't know you had when things like that happens to you. And I don't know about that. Colossians tells me I'm complete in Christ. So it's not that I'm a half a quart low of Holy Spirit in me, and when bad things come, I get a turbo boost. I think what happens is when trouble comes, you start to access those verses you didn't need the day before. You Amen. start to access that doctrine resident in you that you didn't need when everything was happy and wonderful on Monday. And the Holy Spirit resident in you activates that doctrine in you. But I want to, that's what I want. Because this happens to Melissa tomorrow, I don't think I'm ready. I hope I am. Look at Romans chapter 15. Because tragedy is going to come knocking on all of our doors. It may not look as dramatic as this, but it's coming one way or another. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in good, happy circumstances. That's not what it says. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? What you believe. It has nothing to do with bad day or good day. The hope and joy and peace comes from what you believe, and from what you believe, that's when ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the doctrine. It's knowing facts about you, who you are in Christ, what your future is, what God's promised to you, knowing how little this life is in comparison to eternity. It's what you believe 
that fills you with joy and peace, no matter what the circumstance. I know I've talked to you about the way to understand things and the way to see things in a different light is to change your perspective. Look over at Colossians chapter 3, please. Colossians chapter 3, everybody have it? Amen. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, that becomes a lot easier when everything you see around you on the earth becomes three different ways awful, right? When you're laying there in agony, it's a lot easier to set your affections on things that are above. The real way, though, if you then be risen with Christ, if that's where you're at, and that's where you are if you're saved, you're in Christ, judicially resurrected in heavenly places, seated in heavenly places. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are there. Well, what's there? What's there is eternal life. Seek eternal life. Look at things from the perspective of eternal life. The real way for somebody to live through and possibly die from a situation like this, while rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, thankful in all things, is to look at it, not from here, in the trouble, but to look at it from here, eternity. The way God looks at it. What does this awful week look like one million years into eternity. What does it look like looking at it from here? I'm going to get some pedantic person on the internet that will say, there's not years in eternity, it's eternity is eternity. I get it, I get it. What does my entire life here look like to me one million years into my eternal life? Second Corinthians chapter four and verse seventeen. How can Paul live your worst life now, constantly in trouble, constantly fighting for his life, constantly fighting against people who are slandering him, people that are trying to wreck the doctrine of the churches? How can he be the guy saying, rah rah, rejoice, hope, patience, thanksgiving? The only way you can be that guy is if you're looking at this from here. That's the only way. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment... 
that's what this trouble is going to look like a million years out in the future. You said Tuesday, the Bible shortened it up a little bit more for you. It was a light affliction just for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's nothing compared to what it's like here. And then Paul gives us the explanation. He says, how can you say that? While we look not at the things which are seen, I'm not looking at Tuesday, I'm looking at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. There's no way to put frosting on the awful. There's no way to paint a pretty picture for my cousin's family. It's not going to be a happy ending, likely, even if the best case scenario happens. So how can I rejoice evermore, rejoice in hope, and give thanks in everything? It's by looking at it from here. I'm going to be separated from my wife for a moment. Looking at it from here, he said, Paul says our whole life, our entire life is going to be a light affliction, but for a moment. So how can you be rejoice evermore while you're laying there with the brain bleed and leukemia? What do you say to your wife? I'm sorry, honey, that I missed out on a few decades with you back in that old life of pain and sin. But it's and you're, you're talking to her from here. I'm sorry that I missed out on a few decades of with you in that old life of pain and sin. But it was such a small part of life. We've had a million years in glory together. It was nothing. We've been alive together for a million years glorifying God and will never die again. Amen. This will never end. Wasn't it such a light affliction, but for a moment? That's the strength that comes from believing. And we'd all do well to really think about these things and really get this doctrine in us before our day comes. You want to be a witness to somebody when you're having your worst day ever? How about a little rejoice evermore and rejoice in hope when your world's crashing down around you? You will stun people. And they'll listen to somebody that's doing that Amen. when you're ready to share the gospel with them. How can you be like this? I have hope in believing. Would you like to hear the gospel and how I have my hope? Yeah, I'll listen to you. What about to his little girls? You know, each, I, I know how he is likely feeling right now. Every year, you know, the boys you don't worry too much about, but the girls like, just let me survive long enough to get them raised. <laughs> get them sorted out once I, then I can die. <laughs> but what do you say to your daughters when they say, well, there's nothing we can do? You'll be dead in a day or two. <clears throat> what do you say to your daughters from here? A million years out into the future. Sorry, girls, I missed out on a few decades of life with you, raising you back in that old life of pain and sin. I'd hoped to raise you. I'd hoped to see all your firsts. I'd hoped to be there on the day you graduated high school, but I missed that. I'm sorry. But looking at it from here, those things 
those were just temporal. Those were just a moment in time. But the things that we've seen together here in glory, these are eternal. They'll never end, and we'll never die again. We'll never be separated again. Think about it this way. Yeah. You missed You missed the high school graduation. You weren't around when your kids graduated high school. But now, if you're waiting on them in glory, you're there on the day of their death, and you're the one waiting for them, welcoming them on the day they graduate to glory. That's a lot better graduation, isn't it? That's a lot better day. So while he what, if the worst happens, he won't be able to be there for all the firsts of this life of pain and sin. He'll be there for the biggest first of his daughter's lives ever, the most important one, the eternal one that will last forever. That's the only way I see that we can be this in the middle of turmoil and storm and horrible circumstances. And you only have that perspective if you have hope for eternal life. Because if this life is all there is, if there's no God, no eternity, no Jesus, this Put him out of his misery, let him go to oblivion, right? There's nothing after this. It's hopeless. But we have an apostle that's commanded us over and over again to be this, rejoicing evermore, rejoicing in hope, and giving thanks in all things. Lord, this is the worst day of my life. But I am so grateful that I have a hope of what's coming, no matter if the worst happens to my body. That's giving thanks in all things. So that, I know that was kind of heavy, but that is how we can be the ones who are able to face tragedy, to face pain, to face suffering, and to face possibly the loss of loved ones while rejoicing in hope and giving thanks in all things. We look at how the situation looks from home. Because if you're saved, heaven and eternity are your home. You're here as an ambassador. How does it look from home? It was nothing. It was light. Yes, it hurt. It was an affliction. But it was light, and it only lasted a moment. And it worked a far more exceeding weight of glory Amen. for all eternity. So that is all I have today. Um, I know that was kind of heavy, but we can be happy and laugh as we uh, go have food together. Is, what's the situation with the food? It's late? Delayed. Delayed. Well, that's not good. I have lots of questions. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, let's, um, let's close in prayer, and then if anybody needs to go, they can go, and then we can open up the floor for questions.